Mighty God, we ask that you would attend with power the truth that is preached today. May we, your people, be refreshed by it, melted under it, convicted by it, and even comforted by it. May your word prevail in this place and in each heart, I pray. Amen. This morning, Christians around the world are going to be, or have already, recited a simple confession that has echoed down through the centuries of church history. If you were with us in the adult Sunday school class for the first half of this year, or you've grown up in a church perhaps that recited the Apostles' Creed regularly, you'll know how the creed begins. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Or, maybe as a kid, you grew up in Sunday school singing that same truth in verse form. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too. Both the creed and the children's song express the simplest, most foundational doctrine on a level that all can understand. God is omnipotent. That is, God is all-powerful. Listen to what David heard God say to him in Psalm 62, 11. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. That is David's way of saying God is the ultimate source of all power. The inference we're to make from David's words in the psalm and many other passages that are in our Bible is that power is so in God only that no one is able to do anything unless they continually receive power from God to do it. Whatever lesser power exists or is exercised in God's universe is given by God, mediated by God, governed by God, and on loan from God. Virtually every page of the Bible heralds that God is almighty, that God is the almighty, as we heard in Exodus chapter 6. You hardly get four or five words into the entire Bible, and you are face to face with God's omnipotence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Because the subject of God's omnipotence is so vast, and I cannot possibly say everything there is to say on it in a single message, I'm simply going to use this time this morning by giving you the cliff notes or the subheadings to God's omnipotence, which I'm not going to have time to fully unpack in a message. And so I want to start by giving you the cliff notes, five big summary statements concerning God's omnipotence. First, the omnipotence of God is that ability and strength whereby he can do whatsoever he pleases. The psalmist says, For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. So the omnipotence of God is that ability and strength whereby he can do whatsoever he pleases. Secondly, God is most able to do whatsoever he pleases according to the infinite wisdom of his will and the infinite purity of his character. That's a way of saying that God's power is always directed by his eternal purposes and it will never contradict his will or his own character. Scripture proclaims that God cannot change, as we saw a few weeks ago, and that he cannot deny himself. So he's never going to cease to be faithful to himself. He'll never use his omnipotence to do that. Because he is holy, he will not employ his omnipotence to sin. Because he is truth, he cannot lie. Because he is faithful, he cannot and he will not break his eternal covenant with his people. Thirdly, God can do all things most easily easily and effortlessly. Jeremiah proclaimed in amazement to the Lord, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And how much power did it require for God to create the universe? How much effort does he have to put in to make everything exist? The psalmist says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Take a minute to exhale just now. 
That's more effort, I think, than God had to put into creating everything that's ever been or ever will be. Such is the omnipotence of God. He can do all things most easily and without effort. Number four, God can do all things without means, with means, or contrary to means. So God created the universe, ex nihilo, that is, he created everything out of nothing without any means whatsoever. Or think of salvation. God also uses means for salvation like the preaching of the gospel. Paul said in Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And so God chooses to save people with his omnipotence through the means of witnesses, evangelists, preachers, and missionaries who herald the message of Jesus Christ. And God can even do all things contrary to any means. Think, for example, of how God uses affliction or evil for his purposes. Joseph's brothers, they had intended evil against him, but God meant it for good. Omnipotently, God can use even the smallest of things for his extraordinary purposes. And he can even use sinful things for good and for his glory. That's how powerful our God is. And then fifthly, there is no power in heaven, on the earth, or in hell that can resist, restrain, or frustrate God's omnipotence. Job, after being taken to task by the Lord, confessed in the end, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. King Nebuchadnezzar, that great king of Babylon, after being severely humbled by the Lord, also confessed in Daniel, God does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? There is no power in the spiritual or in the physical realm that can ever overthrow or outwit God's power. His power cannot be checked, restrained, or frustrated. God remains irresistible and invincible. When the nations rage, we see in Psalm 2, God laughs from his throne and holds the nations in derision. One Almighty is more than all the mighties of the universe put together. This is all but a taste of what it means for David to say, power belongs to God. These are just the the cliff notes as we consider it at the forefront of the message. Overall, I want to show you that God's omnipotence means that God is almighty and is most able to do all things without difficulty. Or if you prefer that line in the children's song, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. In the time that we have, I want us to continue to look at how big our God is. I want to present to you a big God, the big God we worship. Each of us needs a big view of the big God of the Bible. We need not only to have heads that think big thoughts of God so that our worship rises higher, but we must also have hearts that put our trust in Him as well. Simply put, if our view of God and His power is too small... Not only will we think wrongly of him, but we will not trust him as we ought and as we're commanded. So it's my desire to give you a brief, but a big view of God and his power. We're going to look at some ways that scripture shows God's power to be big. And then like last week, we'll consider the so what question near the end. What is the relevance of God's omnipotence to you and to me this morning? Let's first catch a bigger vision of God's omnipotence in the Bible than we already have in the cliff notes. As with the other omni-attributes, this is obviously not all there is to know about God's omnipotence, but I think these are fundamental truths that pop off the page of Scripture. Here are at least four more ways that Scripture reveals God's power to be so big, so strong, and so mighty. Perhaps the first place we need to start to catch a bigger vision of God's omnipotence is to start with the fact that God's power is incomparable. God's power cannot be compared to any other. His power is unlike anything or anyone else's power. The psalmist Ethan gives us this big vision of God's incomparable power in Psalm 89. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. 
the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that is in it, you have founded them. In verse 8, Ethan asks this rhetorical question, and the implicit answer is, no one is as mighty as the Lord God of hosts. Then, in verses 9 to 11, Ethan illustrates his point. God rules the raging sea. To us Illinoisans, Illinesians, I'm not sure what we're officially called, I've only been here four years, but we're living smack dab in the middle of the continent in the 21st century, and so the magnitude of this reality that God calms the raging sea or that he rules over the raging sea, it might be foreign to us. Maybe you've seen videos online of cruise ships out in the middle of the Pacific or Atlantic, and they're videoing a storm as wave after wave roll in, and all you can see for miles all around you are these impressive waves, and it just fills you with fear just watching it. Well, the ancient world also had that kind of fear of the sea. It was equated with ultimate chaos. It was the realm of evil. It was the untamable in the world. But Ethan wanted Israel to worship the God who rules this raging sea. Unlike anyone or anything else, Yahweh can control the uncontrollable. He can tame the untamable. He can quiet the raging waters of the sea. This is, of course, the omnipotent power that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ possesses, as we see in the Gospels. You'll remember that occasion when Jesus and his disciples decide to cross the Sea of Galilee, and during the journey, Jesus decides he's going to take a nap, and he falls asleep while this great squall rises, and the the waves are breaking into the boat, threatening to sink the ship. The experienced fishermen, disciples, they wake Jesus up in a panic. Maybe they're hoping that Jesus is going to grab a bucket along with them and start scooping out some water, or maybe he would grab an oar to the, to the ship and help steer it through the tempest. Instead, Jesus does the unthinkable, the unexpected to the disciples, the unbelievable, and he exercises power that no one else in that boat or in the world has power to exercise. He commanded the wind, the wind and the waves, saying, peace be still. And immediately the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And you'll remember the disciples' reaction. They were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? They couldn't put Jesus into a category. He's unlike any man they'd ever known. And the answer, really, to the disciples' fearful wonderment is that Jesus is God in the flesh, the God of Psalm 89. Going back to Psalm 89, not only does God have unparalleled power to calm the raging sea, but he also has the power to destroy the mighty beasts of the deep. That's what is meant by Rahab here in verse 10. It's not Rahab, the harlot from Jericho, but rather Rahab, this primeval sea dragon or serpent. The ancients viewed Rahab as the dragon of chaos. Sometimes scripture speaks of Rahab as this literal sea monster, while other times it's clear that Rahab is symbolic of God's enemies, like the nation of Egypt pursuing Israel to the Red Sea, and God is superior over Egypt. And so I think that's the point that Ethan is making here with Rahab, is that God's power is superior to all other powers, whether they be beasts in the sea or kings and rulers of nations like Pharaoh over Egypt. Ethan concludes that all of this is because, in verse 11, that everything belongs to God. The heavens are God's, the earth and its fullness are his, the mountains are his, the valleys are his, the rivers and the stars are his handiwork too. He alone creates order out of chaos. He rules with ultimate power. In all the universe, God's power is marvelously incomparable. Secondly, God's power is inscrutably incomprehensible. Perhaps you see the redundancy in my point here, and I hope you do. It's like me saying that God's power is mysteriously mysterious. The French philosopher and theologian Blaise Pascal spoke of God's omnipotence in this way. The greatest single distinguishing feature of the omnipotence of God is that our imagination gets lost when thinking about it. I think that's true not just of omnipotence, but also omniscience and omnipresence, as we've been seeing. Our mind gets lost trying to comprehend the infinite. Job expresses this very truth in one of his responses to his miserable comforters. In Job 26, Job says, The dead tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before God, and Abaddon has no covering. 
He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not split open under them. He covers the face of the full moon and spreads over it his cloud. He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. By his power he stilled the sea. By his understanding he shattered Rahab. There she is again. By his wind the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Behold, here it is, these are but the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? The greatest, most powerful things in creation that we can observe, either with the telescope or the microscope or the naked eye, that leave us all baffled or fearful or however it affects our emotions. Job is just saying these are but the fringes of God's incredible and infinite power. Commenting on verse 14, the Puritan Stephen Charnock said, These are but little crumbs and fragments of that infinite power which, in, which is in God's nature. Like a drop in comparison of the mighty ocean, a hiss or whisper in comparison of a mighty voice of thunder. This is God's incomprehensible power. That God's power is incomprehensible is not just taught in the Old Testament, it's also in the New Testament in relation to God's work in the lives of his people. The Apostle Paul, he closes his second great prayer in the letter to the Ephesians with this great doxology, attempting to give us a big vision of God's incredible incomprehensible power. Consider just verse 20 at the beginning of Paul's doxology in chapter 3 of Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. You notice all the superlatives that Paul is piling one on top of another. He's stacking them up to show us how incomprehensible God's power is. God is able. God is able to do far more God is able to do far more abundantly. God is able to do far more abundantly than all. God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask. God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Paul is inviting us, I think, to pray big, bold, confident prayers to our big God who has no limit to his power. The apostle, he's giving us the green light to turn up the volume on all of our prayers. God lacks no resource that you require. His arm is not too short to help, nor does he ever stiff arm his beloved children in Christ. You can come to him, and his infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible power is available to answer your requests and to aid you in living a life that is pleasing to him. As Newton wrote, thou art coming to a king. Large, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much. Strangely, we will never reach the bottom of the deep end of the pool of God's incomprehensible power, but we can set our feet solidly upon it in faith, and we can even go after it in prayer. On a related note, thirdly, God's power is limitlessly inexhaustible. Since God is unchanging, so is his power. God doesn't get stronger, nor does he get weaker over time or after exerting energy. He remains consistently and limitlessly almighty. We have this truth packaged in various scriptures. The psalmist extolled God's greatness this way, great is our Lord and abundant in power. The Hebrew word abundant here is translated elsewhere in a myriad of ways. Could mean numerous, great or vast. Sometimes the word signifies an indefinite number, and it can only simply be translated as abundant or many. On other occasions, the word abundant means enough or sufficient. I think the psalmist is intentionally using this word to illustrate the immensity and infinity of God's almightiness. His is a vast power, a power that cannot be quantified by us, a power that is sufficient for him to be God over all. Isaiah also wrote of God's inexhaustible power in Isaiah 40. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His power never runs out. 
He doesn't have to muster up more strength to do anything. Fatigue is never an issue for him. He can do all things most easily and without difficulty. Believers, we have a heavenly Father who is never worn out by his children. As a human father, I envy that in our heavenly Father. If you know anything about Owen, he's one great ball of energy. And when I come home from the office on weekdays after studying, all I want to do is sink into the couch and unwind while Owen is quite literally bouncing off the walls and the furniture, always trying to pull me into his fun. And so sometimes I just have to stop him and say, Owen, daddy's tired. Give me a minute or two. Our Heavenly Father doesn't need a minute or two. He doesn't faint or grow weary, nor does He grow tired of doing the same things over and over and over again. Every day the sun comes up. Every day the, the, the moon comes out during the end of the day. He does all things with infinite energy and enthusiasm. Listen also to what the psalmist says in Psalm 121. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. God doesn't sleep. He doesn't have to rest his eyes for a bit. He doesn't have to take Sunday afternoon naps. He's ever awake and always vigilant to show himself strong for the sake of his redeemed. We were designed by God to rest and to sleep as a daily reminder that we are not omnipotent and that we depend on his omnipotence. But God, he's independent, he's self-sufficient, his power is an inexhaustible fountain from which we must continually draw our strength. Fourth, and not surprisingly, God's power can do the humanly impossible. Nothing is too hard for him, and all things are possible for our God. We heard earlier how Jeremiah was enraptured with God's power to do the impossible in creation. Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. As impossible as the creation of the universe is, I I can think of nothing more humanly impossible than conversion, redemption, regeneration, or whatever word you wish to use as a label for salvation. Consider the account of the, the rich young ruler in the Gospels. Jesus shows the rich young ruler and his disciples who are listening in just how impossible it is for anyone to enter into the kingdom of God to be saved. The rich young ruler, you'll recall, he was a devoted law keeper, obeying the law since his youth, and yet he asks the Lord an all-important question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You'll remember what Jesus demanded of him. You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. The man goes away disheartened, greatly sorrowful, because he had many possessions he wasn't willing to part with. And then Jesus turns to his disciples to give the lesson. Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. He's not just talking about rich people here. He's talking about all people. Because the disciples, they're exceedingly astonished, and they said to him, then who can be saved? Verse 27 of Mark 10, Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. To the disciples, this rich young ruler, he appeared to be the prime candidate for God's kingdom. He had obeyed God's law, Seemingly without flaw, he appeared to be greatly blessed by God for his obedience. That's why he has all this wealth, the disciples think. If anyone of his position and his condition couldn't possibly inherit eternal life, then what hope does anyone else have? The only hope any one of us has, whether we're rich or poor, young or old, morally religious, or maybe miserably rebellious against God, our only hope is in Almighty God. Who can be saved? Answer, none but by the power of God. When it comes to salvation, we are totally impotent, and we are utterly in need of the omnipotent God to breathe new life into our dead hearts, to unplug our deaf ears to hear His voice, to enlighten our darkened minds to understand His Word, and to open our eyes to the beauty of Jesus Christ so that we would treasure him above all others. 
with man. This is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God, even the salvation of the wicked. So what? What's the relevance of God's omnipotence to us? What are the implications in God's omnipotence? And I think I see at least three that I want to mention throughout the Scriptures. First, God's omnipotence demands awful reverence from us. I'm using that word awful in its original meaning, not how we use it today. We use it today to mean something like terrible or frightful, but originally awful just uh, simply meant to be filled with awe, or as we sang in one of our songs, awestruck or awesome might be an appropriate word today in our language. Anyway, that all power belongs so to God and he's able to do whatsoever he pleases without any difficulty ought to fill us with a holy fear. The fear of God is his due. After mentioning how God created the universe with the mere breath of his mouth, the psalmist arouses us to awful reverence in Psalm 33. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Charles Spurgeon helps us envision what kind of fear is required of us as we look at God's power, especially in creation. Gazing upon the vast expanse of water, looking up to the innumerable stars, examining the wing of an insect, and seeing there the matchless skill of God displayed in the minute, or standing in a thunderstorm, watching, as best you can, the flashes of lightning and listening to the thunder of Jehovah's voice, have you not often shrunk into yourself and said, Great God, how terrible art thou! Not afraid, but full of delight, like a child who rejoices to see his father's wealth, his father's wisdom, his father's power, happy and at home, but feeling oh so little. So awful reverence is that holy combination. It's that concoction of admiration as well as alarm, delight as well as dread, friendly terror and joyful shock, awestruck. If God does not incite within you awful reverence, then you can be sure that your God is too small. A big God deserves great reverence. A second implication of God's omnipotence relates to what God will do to those who try to resist his power and rebel against him. God's omnipotence means wrathful recompense. I was reading Nahum the other day, and I was struck by the force of the prophet's opening lines to Nineveh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. God's omnipotence is an assurance and an insurance to his saints that he will never let wickedness off the hook. He will never let the guilty go scot-free without punishment. He will not acquit the guilty. If you think that sounds too Old Testament, For today's times, I would point you to the book of Revelation, the revelation that Jesus gave to the Apostle John about the day of Christ's coming in Revelation 19. Behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. This is Jesus Christ riding on a war horse, with an army behind him of angels, sword drawn, striking down the wicked, dipping his robes in their blood, treading the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Let the gravity of that sink into your heart this morning. Together, the prophet Nahum and Jesus' revelation to John teach us that never once has God pardoned an unpunished sin and will in no wise acquit the guilty. The guilty. 
That might come as a shock to you this morning. You might be thinking, what? Are there not many sinners who have been pardoned and whose sins have been stricken from the record of God's ledger? Has God not promised me, I've blotted out all your transgressions? And yes, that is true if you're a believer. But still, my point remains just as valid. Not one of all your sins, which have been pardoned, were pardoned without punishment. Look to the cross, and I will show you. There you'll see the punishment which fell not on the pardoned sinner, fell in full force on Calvary, on Jesus Christ. There at the cross, sin is justly punished by God, and the sinner is also pardoned by God. And so you see that sin will never go unpunished. Either your sin was punished in full in the death of Jesus Christ, or it will be punished in full when he comes to dip his robes in your blood and tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. That is of tremendous weight. And that brings me to a third implication of God's omnipotence that might bring you some consolation. God's omnipotence means peaceful refuge. Since the wrathful recompense of God is coming to punish every unpardoned sin, then where are you looking for peaceful refuge today? God is omniscient. He knows all of your secret sins that you hide from others. He's omnipresent. There's no place in the universe you can run and escape from Him. Your only hope of fleeing the wrath to come is by running to the one whose wrath it is. You must realize what the psalmist came to realize in Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Have you come to understand what this means. It means that when you trust in the Almighty, you are protected by omnipotent grace from omnipotent wrath. Have you taken cover beneath the cross of Jesus? There's only salvation at the cross where He has shed His omnipotent blood for your sins. Without any reservation today, turn to Christ and you are promised rescue from the wrath that is to come. My fellow saints, the uh, uh, omnipotence of God also means refuge for us all of our days. Omnipotence is an ark for all God's Noahs. It's the solid rock in a world that's filled with sinking sand. When you're weak and when you're weary in the wilderness, in the shadow of the Almighty, the omnipotent God will renew your strength. When you're bruised, when you're battered by the storms of life, the power of God will be your shelter and your hospital. His grace is sufficient for you in your weakness, for in your need His power is displayed. The infinite resources of the Almighty are for those who fear Him. So this morning, ponder anew what the Almighty can do. He wondrously reigns over all. He graciously shelters you under His wings and so gently sustains you. He prospers your work and He defends you. Surely His goodness and mercy here daily attend you to. The Lord's table is a visible reminder to us of God's omnipotence. Communion, it's a celebration of God's almighty power at the cross and through the empty tomb, through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, through the resurrection from the grave. God's benevolent omnipotence is demonstrated towards those who put their faith in Jesus. God's omnipotence was not exercised at the cross to spare his son from suffering because it was being exercised to save his people. We look at the emblems of the Lord's table this morning, and from a very human perspective, they are representatives of weakness. Bread, the body of Christ given to be pierced on a cross, the cup, the blood that Jesus shed unto death. In the eyes of the world, it's all foolishness and weakness. But to those of us who believe, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The omnipotence of God in our salvation leaves no room for human boasting in His presence. Power belongs to God. Salvation belongs to Him too. He alone has done the impossible on behalf 
of those who believe through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as we come to the table together, let's leave our boasting behind, except to make our boast in our omnipotent God. Let the words of David be on our heart as we come. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We sing and praise your power.